get started with today's uh, webinar, as you can see on your screens, we will talk about diamonds. And of course, this is what connects so many people from so many different parts of the world. Um, so we'll start by talking about the diamonds themselves. What is a diamond? Of course, you all have your own ideas about what the diamond can be or what it represents to everybody, let's say. But there are some standard things that make diamonds so special. Well, diamonds are extremely fascinating, not only because they are you know, beautiful and that they have such a long story, but because they are very special, very unique as minerals as well. They're actually the only gemstones, <clears throat> the only gem minerals that are um, made composed of one single element, which is carbon, of course, as you all, uh, I'm sure you all know. Um, most other minerals or other minerals actually that we use as gemstones are composed of combinations of different elements that are um, held together, put together. So diamonds are unique, uh, not only because they, uh, they have a very, very lengthy history and they're very, um, a very big importance and symbolism on their back, but also because they are very um, unique in the, in, the, in the way they're made. So they're the only gemstone that is made of one single element. This element, as we mentioned before, is carbon. Sometimes we might have some other um, trace elements that um, are found in their uh, lattice. And the other very unique thing about diamonds is how they form and where they form and when they form. So diamonds form under very high temperature. We're talking about temperatures that go um, more than 1000 degrees Celsius most of the times and uh, under very, very high pressure. So we're talking about uh, pressure between 45 or 60 kilobars and uh, they form very deep inside the earth. Um, the depths might range between 140 to 190 kilometers, but there are some diamonds which we call the super deep diamonds that originate that form um, very, very deep, super deep inside the earth, about 800 kilometers deep. So we're talking about an environment that's very, very hostile. Nothing can survive down there except for the diamonds. So diamonds are unique because of their uh, chemistry, because of their, uh, the way they form, because of the formation conditions. But of course, they are very, very special because they have always held a very um, important symbolism to the hearts of the people. So the temperature and pressure work very, um, are very powerful when they work together they form diamonds and the reason why diamonds are so different from other uh, materials that are composed of carbon like for example graphite which we use in our pencilets is um, the way those carbon atoms hold themselves together in the lattice of diamonds. What is responsible for this um, crystal structure as we call it is exactly the formation environment. So um, the difference between this fantastic, this precious, this super important material that is diamond and um, a very common material, which is graphite, lies in the way these carbon atoms uh, fit together in the crystal lattice of uh, the diamonds. Now, the name diamond is a very, let's say, common word. Everybody has heard of the word diamond. Everybody has a picture coming to their heads when they uh, hear the word diamond. But actually that name is one name that is um, suitable, perfectly suitable for this material. The name diamond derives from this Greek word which you see in the bottom of your screens, which um, means um, a material that cannot be tamed, that cannot be uh, conquered. It's an invincible material. So imagine that these properties of hardness and toughness and durability of the diamonds uh, were the properties that led people to give it this extremely mighty, powerful name, diamond. Diamond as a name, as a word, means that we're talking about something that cannot be tamed. So. Um, as you understand, diamonds are extremely um, fierce, extremely unique, and they are some of the most antique materials that we get, that are blessed to get our hands on. Think that diamonds um, that we're using today were forming at a moment in history where the earth looked very different from what it does now. We're talking about a material that has an age that ranges between 1 billion and 
almost three and a half billion uh, years old. So it's like we're, we are working with something that has an extreme value, even if you simply think of its antiquity, of, of its age. So diamonds are definitely a perfect, the perfect material to, um, to have this name. That means something that cannot be tamed, that cannot be conquered. So back to you, Sophie, let's start talking about diamonds and their history. Thank you, Ava. So yes, if we look at the use of diamonds in history, it, we can see that they have been used in jewelry designs for centuries, um, but also in industry. And that happens even today because of their hardness, because of their durability. It's estimated that even today, 80% of diamonds that are mined are used in industry with only the remaining 20% used in jewelry. But looking back at the history and where we start seeing these references to, jewel, uh, to diamonds in the literature. So the earliest reference comes from Northern India in a Sanskrit uh, manuscript written by a minister at the court of the king. And even then we can start seeing the value and the prestige that was attributed to diamonds. He writes that the quality of an excellent diamond is big, heavy, capable of bearing blows with symmetrical points, capable of scratching a glass vessel revolving like a spindle and brilliantly shining. So as Eva said, the word comes from, the word diamond comes from Adamus, which is a Greek word. And this is what we see Pliny the Elder, the Roman writer, refer to it in his book, Natural Histories. And again, his quotes here shows how it's very valued at this time. He says, the substance that possesses the greatest value, not only amongst precious stones, but of all human possessions is Adamus. A mineral for a long time was known to kings only and to very few of them. And there was also historically this belief in their magical powers. There was a belief in protection over the wearer. And Pliny also writes that, you know, it overcomes and neutralizes poisons, dispels delirium and banishes the groundless thoughts of the mind. So it's really quite a useful material. And looking, we can see see here so in this lovely Roman diamond ring from the third or fourth century we can see how it was used in jewelry in the earliest stages and nothing was done to the diamond at this point there was no cutting capabilities and also they didn't want to you know destruct any of these magical properties that we thought this diamond had so we see them here we see this diamond it's just loose octahedral crystal form set into a piece of jewelry and then after the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity, we see diamonds kind of dropping out of European history for a time, but they remained very popular in the Indian Islamic world. So we still see continued historical references to them during this time. So if we go to the next slide, we can start thinking about, you know, why was this value attributed to them? Why were they so valued? And a lot of this was to do with their early rarity. So today we know that diamonds are mined from all over the world. You know, we've got them in Australia, we've got them in Africa, Canada, Russia. But until about 1725, the only known source of diamonds in the world was from India. And particularly famous in India was the Golconda mines. And the Golconda mines was famous for producing some of the world's most famous diamonds today. So for example, the Kohinoor or the Hope Diamond, we may have heard of these stones. And they originated from these Golconda mines. And one of the reasons why Golconda was so renowned was that they produced, or the mines produced, these diamonds of exceptional quality. It's what we call in the gemological world type 2A. And it means that they're very pure and free from nitrogen. So what Ava was talking about before, that they're main, mainly made up of carbon and they have these trace elements in some diamonds. And nitrogen is what is known for producing the yellow color that we so commonly see in white diamonds, you know, um, kind of stages of yellow color. But Golconda mines, these type 2A diamonds, they only make up about 1% to 2% of diamonds that are mined today. And they're very pure. They either come in exceptionally white colors. It's almost kind of referred to as a very clear water when you hold it in your hands, or in brown, pink, or blue tones. And so if we look at some of the famous diamonds that came from this region, one of these was the Beau Sancy, which we sold at Sotheby's Geneva in 2012. And this drew a brown tint. Um, and this was owned, you know, the lovely thing about these famous stones is that we know a little bit about their history. And the, one of the earliest owners of this stones was this lady here on the left, Marie de Medici. 
who was the richest heiress in Europe, and she was married to Francis Henry IV in 1600. And jewellery was undoubtedly her passion, which she inherited from her father, who was a bit of a gemstone connoisseur, Francesco. And he taught her that nothing, no other stone is as majestic and commands as much respect as diamond. So you obviously have the lovely blue of sapphire, red of ruby, green of emerald, but the ability of diamond to absorb light and reflect it means that it can be seen from afar and really commands rank and respect. So with this in mind, Marie de Medici set her sights on acquiring two of the then largest diamonds in the world, one of which was the Sansi, which weighed 55 carats, and one was the Beau Sansi, which weighed just under 35 carats. And she was furious when she lost out on the Sansi in 1610, sorry, 1604, when England's James I bought it to wear in his hat. So she hastily bought the Beau Sancy and made sure that it was on full view in her coronation in 1610, where she wore it at the top of her pearl and diamond crown. Um, but unfortunately, it was a bit of a sorry tale after this point. Her husband, Henry IV, was assassinated the day after the coronation. And so her son, Louis, became king, but he was only nine years old, so she became the queen regent. And she had a very difficult time controlling the political and religious problems at the time. So she actually ended up falling out with a lot of people, making some enemies, one of which was her son. So she ended up going into exile and um, settling in Cologne in 1630. And by the time she passed away in 1642, she'd long lost the Beau seat to a pawnbroker. She was unable to redeem her pledge. Uh, but from then, it then passed down, it was bought, passed down through various owners and ended up in the Prussian crown jewels before it was offered for auction at Sotheby's Geneva in 2012. And we can see here at an estimate of 1.9 to 3.9 million that ended up making just over $9 million. So then, if we look at the next slide, we can talk. So, so the Indian diamonds, they came out, they were the, main, the world's main supplier of diamonds until about 1725 when gold miners discovered diamonds in Brazil. And from then until about 1870, Brazil produced the majority of the world's diamonds. Until in 1866, a young Africana boy called Erasmus Jacobs, he's 15 years old, he was working on his father's mine. And according to him, he said, in the glare of the strong sun, I saw a flittering pebble yards away in Kimberley. I, of course, had no idea that stone was of any value. And after reaching home, I handed the pretty pebble to my younger sister, who simply placed it amongst her playthings. And unbeknown to them, they were then visited by their neighbour, and he spotted this pretty pebble, and he ended up taking it, it was gifted it by Erasmus's mother, she gave him this pretty pebble, and he ended up selling it to a, for a few pounds to a dealer. Um, but it was only several owners later, when it was a surgeon and an amateur mineralogist who was examining it, Dr. Atherstone, that he discovered what it actually was. It was a 21 and a quarter carat diamond that was the first to be known to come from South Africa. So this was later cut into this cushion shaped Eureka diamond that we see here weighing just mm -hmm. under uh, 10 points, uh, 10 and three quarters carats. And this is on view in the Kimberley Museum in South Africa, if you ever want to go and see it. But news quickly spread about this amazing discovery. And so by 1969, the area of Kimberley was the focus of the diamond rush, which started with, you know, digging in the soft earth and then later going further down into the volcanic rock that we now call Kimberlite. And so over the next 15 years or so, this activity would result in over 95% of the world's diamond supply coming from this area around Kimberley in South Africa. And this increased supply of diamonds meant um, that we could start experimenting with cutting them a lot more. We had much more material, we could do a lot with them. We weren't so worried about the waste and you know, losing some of this precious material. So if we go to the next slide, we can roughly see how the cut has evolved over the centuries. So the first one, if we're looking at it, so 
this is kind of the point cut. So before even the point cut, we had it when we saw, you know, in this Roman ring that we saw a few slides ago, just set into its loose, as its loose octahedral form within jewelry. And as we were saying, they didn't want to cut it because they didn't have the capabilities, but also they didn't want to disrupt any of the magical properties. And this continued up until about the 14th century, which is when we start seeing some of the first attempts at diamond cutting. And a lot of these happened in Venice, because it was the Venetian merchants that opened up the trade routes with India. And uh, the Indian, uh, in India, they kept a lot of the best quality octahedral crystals. And so it made, you know, the lesser quality ones went to Italy and it made the Venetian cutters, you know, need to become a little bit more imaginative with how to make these diamonds look as beautiful as possible. And so the first major development was the point cut, which just kind of just gently involved polishing the diamond to give it a little bit of extra shine, but you know, loosely followed the octahedral form of the crystal. But in the uh, the next one was the the first facet, if you like, and this involved just simply lopping off the top point of the crystal, and this is what we call the table cut. And this was a major discovery because suddenly they realised that by opening up this window, if you like, into the stone, into the diamond, it made it look a lot more attractive because it could now absorb light and start reflecting it, meaning it became much more sparkly. So from there, we start seeing the involvement of the rose cut. Um, and this meant that at first it was just simply on the point of a crystal, six facets were engraved uh, or were cut and this kept on evolving and so eventually we ended up with a 24 facet full rose cut diamond. And then this kind of continued up until about the early 1700s. And then when the diamond mines or diamond supplies were discovered in Brazil, we then start seeing the emergence of the cutting that more closely resembles what we know today as the modern round brilliant cut. Mm -hmm. So if we look on the bottom left, this is the old mine cut. Um, and this was the first you know, stone that had 58 facets, which is the same as the modern round brilliant. But you can see it's, you know, it's got a much higher table, uh, sorry, a much smaller table and a much higher crown and a larger culet at the bottom. And they had an outline kind of a more cushioned squarish shape because at this point everything was cut by hand and it was just early diamond cutters literally achieving this shape by grinding two diamonds together which created these very unique outlines. And this again was changed with the bruting machine invention, which happened in 1884, and this allowed more precision and more control, because it was a uh, mechanized wheels covered in oil and diamond dust, and I'm sure Ava's going to go into more detail about this in the future slides, but um, diamond is the only material that can cut diamond at this point, so this is why they had to put the, the diamond dust on the wheel. And so, and then in about the 1950s, we start to see the emergence of the modern round brilliant cut, which is the bottom right, which is as we know it today. And this is cut to very specific angles, very specific dimensions to make sure that any light goes in is completely internally reflected so that we get the maximum sparkle and also dispersed as well. So we get the fire. Um, and these ones that are kind of in between the old mine cut and the modern round brilliant, we refer to as kind of European or transitional cuts. Over to you, Ava. Okay, so as Sophie was saying, the earliest development of the modern round brilliant cut, which is the last one that you saw in the previous slide, the one that we uh, mostly use today and the one that has 57 or 58 facets, as Sophie mentioned, uh, can be traced, um, as we just said, to the um, 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, when it was uh, a gentleman called Henry Morse that discovered the proportions that produced um, the effect that he had in mind, that he envisioned, let's say. And it was in 1990 when Mr. Marcel Tolkowski actually published his proportions, his ideal proportions in his uh, diamond design book. So those proportions, those ideas that this gentleman had back in the day are actually um, still the same, more or less the same proportions that we use today to fashion uh, around brilliant cut diamonds. Now, um, in these images here, you see a little bit more uh, modern cut diamonds. Notice that both the diamonds you see in your screens have more or less a, a similar outline, but they look so different. They have so different reflections in them. They, they have such a different appearance, although they might have the same um, size and almost the same outline in their shape. So 
Um, the key thing here is that when we want to describe the, um, a finished diamond's form, we need to describe, we need to talk about two different things, the shape and the cutting style. So the shape uh, is, is a very straightforward thing to, uh, to refer to. It's the face up outline of a gem. So uh, it can be round, it can be square, it can be a heart shape, or it can be a drop shape. So the, the face up outline of the gem, which is the first thing we always uh, describe. And then we also have to talk about uh, what we call the cutting style. The cutting style is very different from the shape. The cutting style refers to the shape and the arrangement of the gems facets. So all those little polished surfaces you have um, on the top of your uh, finished gems. So to completely describe uh, the form of a diamond, we should always describe these two thing things, the shape and the cutting style. As Sophie mentioned before, it's a round, brilliant cut. So she mentioned both the shape and the cutting style. Um, when we are talking about the term fancy cut or fancy cutting styles or fancy cut diamond, we simply refer to all those diamonds that are not round. So considering the cut of the diamonds, we have the round stones that should be described by their shape and the cutting style and all the other shapes, any other shape that you might encounter in the market qualifies as a fancy shape. So the term cut doesn't really uh, simply talk about the shape of a, of a gem, but it describes um, a whole study, let's say, of the proportions of the gem, of the finish of the gem, and of course, of the shape and the cutting style of the gem. Now, um, um, the marquise, which is this one up here, the navette, as we also call it, and the pear shape that you see down here, also called the drop shape or the teardrop shape, are actually um, around for centuries. The pear shape was developed around 1470, 1475, uh, if I'm not wrong, Sophie, correct me. Uh, so the marquise and the pear shape are actually uh, cutting styles or shapes that humans have been used to, have been using since um, many years from now. Um, but the uh, other fancy shapes that you see here all share one common characteristic. They're all brilliant cutting styles. They're all brilliant cuts. So fancy shapes and brilliant cuts. We should describe and uh, describe them by their shape. So heart or square or marquees or oval or drop shape and the cutting style. So when we talk about brilliant cutting style, we're talking about those diamonds that are polished in a way that their facets are all triangular and kite shaped, like this like rhomb shape, if you wish. And they tend to radiate from a central point towards the girdle. So usually the central point where they um, radiate from is the culottes, this little facet or the point where all the pavilion facets meet at the bottom of the diamond. So every time we talk about a brilliant cut stone, we're talking about this shape and this arrangement of its facets. Now concerning the overall shape of the stone, the brilliant cut diamonds can come, as you can see in these images, into many different shapes. Why did we discover all these different shapes? Why did we develop or do have the need to develop all these different shapes since, since the round brilliant cut worked so nicely? where uh, the variations of the round brilliant cut became quite uh, popular after we have uh, invented, let's say, the round brilliant, because the cutters wanted to um, apply this success of the round brilliant, this beauty of the round brilliant, to other shapes as well. The reason behind that is very simple. We have seen some rough diamonds in the previous images, and we have all uh, seen that they had more or less an octahedral shape, so this kind of bipyramid uh, perfect habit. The truth is, however, that in reality, um, not all diamonds look as perfect as these octahedrons in nature. We have a lot of times, most of the times, we have oddly shaped rough diamonds. So if we tried to cut their own brilliant uh, out of all of those rough crystals, we would end up by having a lot of waste of a very precious rough. So we had to take advantage, let's say, of um, the must of the weight on these uh, rough crystals without wasting a lot of it, but also keeping a, a very beautiful, a very sparkling appearance on the surface of the gem. So we um, took the brilliant cutting style and we applied it to different uh, shapes. 
And the result was in reality uh, what the goal was basically. So to retain more weight and to keep the beauty of the brilliant cut. For example, if we talk about the princess cut that you see here, this square brilliant cut, think that um, this diamond, if you're not familiar with these diamonds, you could imagine that in the profile, it looks like an upside down pyramid, for example. So this diamond, this cutting, this cutting style has a very deep bottom part, very deep pavilion and a very shallow crown. But as you can see from the top, it's very, very sparkling, very uh, bright. So it looks very pretty. It combines the brightness and the sparkle and this scintillation and pattern of round brilliance to a very square or rectangular outline. Uh, the other good thing about the princess cut is that it uh, tends to retain a lot of the weight from the rough. If you consider that cutting around brilliant cut would mean that we have a waste of about 50% of the rough. So from a 10 carat uh, octahedron, we would end up with, a, I don't know, let's say about five or six carat in the polished round brilliance. The princess cut diamonds would retain about 80% of the rough. So it is a very, very good option if we want to save maximum weight from the rough and still um, create a very sparkling, very beautiful stone. So brilliant cutting style or brilliant cut, if you wish, refers to the faceting arrangement and the shape of these facets and not at the shape of the stone. So again, we will describe these stones as um, as follows, let's say heart shape, brilliant cut, or square, brilliant, or drop, brilliant. So both the shape and the cutting style. Apart from the brilliant um, cutting styles that you saw before, we also had the so-called step cuts or step cutting styles. And these cutting styles are those that feature no more uh, triangular facets, but now the facets become long, narrow, and four-sided, so square or rectangular, and they don't radiate from a central point, but they tend to be in uh, parallel rows to each other and parallel also to the girdle of the stone. So the most famous cutting, the most famous uh, step cutting style that I'm sure you're familiar with is this uh, so-called emerald cut. And is a cutting style that we very often use in emeralds, actually, and that's where the name comes from. So the emerald cut features um, square and rectangular facets mostly, several rows of those facets. And as you notice, it also has what we call the beveled corners. So the corners don't come to a point, but they are cut uh, with an extra facet here. These two stones you see on the top right and on the bottom here are the so-called baguettes. This is another step cut stone. Usually we use this cutting style for smaller stones, mostly used as accent stones, let's say on the left and right or around a central diamond or a central color stone. Usually they have less rows of facets than the uh, emerald cut. And as you notice, they come to points they don't have the bevel corners. And another famous um, step cut is this one down here, which we call the Asher cut. I'm sure you're familiar with the name Asher. It was introduced in 1902, of course, by the family of uh, the Ashers. They are famous diamond cutters. And uh, it is very similar to the emerald cut that you see on the top of the screen, but uh, it has a square outline. And usually the crown tends to be a little bit higher. Now, as you notice, even from the pictures, you understand that the step cuts um, take advantage of a diamond rough that has very high clarity. Because the facets are larger and the uh, sparkle is a little bit lower than the one we find in the brilliant cuts, um, the large tables and the large facets that this uh, cutting style uh, features allows us to easily see in the heart of the stone. So often the cutters will use the step cuts, especially the um, emerald cut, to um, to polish very high clarity gemstones out of it. So depending on the different um, types and the different shapes and different characteristics of the rough crystals, the cutters will choose uh, one of those um, different cutting styles and they will opt for either a step cut or a uh, brilliant cut. So again, here too, we would have to describe the shape and the cutting style. Again, uh, I can never stop repeating this enough the cutting style refers to the uh, shape and arrangement of the facets and not of the shape of the diamond. 
In this image here, you see a collection of several fancy cut diamonds uh, whose shapes are very, um, let's say, unusual. The ones that we saw in the previous images were the most, let's say, traditional cutting styles. Some have been around since the 1400s, like the Pero de Marquis we saw before, or the emerald cut and the stab cuts have actually been developed before the modern and brilliant. Now, these cutting styles, these fancy shapes you see here are not so um, commonly seen. They are more, let's say, um, unusual, unique shapes. And the reason why we can actually create this um, this complex shapes today with diamonds is because we now have used the technology of lasers and not so much the traditional ways of uh, cutting like the rotary saw, for example, or other things that uh, we will also see in the, in the next slide. So with the lasers today, we can actually cut our way, burn our way through any crystal, crystallographic direction of the crystal without really um, caring about the actual direction. We only care about the yield and the um, characteristics of the clarity and the color of the diamond. And we can create any shape we can imagine. As you can see in this image, we can create leaf shapes and butterflies and horse heads and stars and anything we can imagine. Of course, most of these um, non-standard um, cutting styles are proprietary cuts. They are most of them are trademark, and they are um, not so often, not so um, you know, commonly seen in the market. You will see them uh, here and there, uh, especially when they're sold by the companies that actually develop them. Considering the uh, fancy cut diamond grading the procedures, well, there are some things that are common between the round brilliance and the fancy cut diamonds, but um, grading fancy cuts, let's say something of an art. It is um, challenging many in many occasions because there are so many variables. It's not as straightforward as a procedure as uh, the round brilliant diamonds. Of course, we always consider the four Cs, the clarity, the color, the cut, and the carat weight, but we also have to um, consider some extra things. We should uh, take some extra considerations as you see on your screens. There are special shape components um, and all the different parts of the stone uh, should be considered in the context of the overall appearance of the gem. So it takes quite an experienced grader to uh, positively and successfully grade a fancy cut diamond. As we said before, some considerations are the same um, like those from the round brilliant cut, others are different and depend on the shape and the cutting style um, of the diamond involved. For example, for the clarity of those diamonds, well, uh, most of the rules for clarity grading are uh, the same for rounds or for fancies, but there are some extra things we have to think about. Um, one of the most important things to consider, as we mentioned before, is that most fancies are typically cut from irregular rough. So we expect that they will contain characteristics that are a result of structural irregularities of the crystal. So we might expect to see some particular types of clarity characteristics more commonly in fancy shaped diamonds um, rather than in round brilliant diamonds. And the other thing, for example, in this heart shape you see here, is that with the brilliant cuts especially, the cutters tend to um, hide or position the uh, clarity characteristics where we have more sparkles. So let's say uh, in the tip of a uh, brilliant fancy cut that has a tip, like the tip here of the heart shape. So we need to study those parts very carefully because they might cause durability issues. So as you understand, Creating the fancy cut diamonds is, as we mentioned before, some kind of an art, and it takes some extra considerations. <clears throat> Back to you, Sophie. Thank you. So we're going to be looking now at some of the exceptional jewellery pieces that have featured diamonds um, that we've been lucky enough to see passing through our auctions at Sotheby's. Um, and the next couple of slides are going to be looking at uh, pieces created by the, the major jewellery houses, so Van Cleef and also Cartier, which were the go-to places for major jewellery commissions um, from important clients. And the first one we're going to be looking at is this wonderful kind of diamond bib necklace 
which belonged to Queen Nasli of Egypt. And she was uh, the Egyptian King Fuad. She was his second wife. They married in 1919. And this set was designed in 1939 for Queen Nasli for the marriage of her daughter, Princess Fawzia, to the Crown Prince of Iran. So the bride ordered, you know, Van Cleef was asked to supply all of the wedding jewels and the bride ordered, you know, a magnificent pearl for herself. She um, commissioned a collar, two pairs of earrings and a tiara. And Queen Nasli used this opportunity uh, to commission a few pieces of jewellery for herself, which included this wonderful uh, tiara, which was set with a total of 292 carats worth of diamonds, and also this wonderful necklace, which was a complete masterpiece. It's this wonderful sunburst design. And it's this bib style because it's designed to be worn quite high up on the neck for formal occasions. And it's set with a total of 673 diamonds in three rivieres that merge into this kind of sunburst design that we see at the front. It's a six carat round brilliant cut diamond in the center there. And from there, it's suspending four further rivieres of diamonds. So that was a total of 217 carats in that. And so Queen Nasi herself, she had this rather fabulous jewellery collection. It was helped by a rather volatile relationship with her husband because she was a very independent, well-educated, hot-headed lady. And she frequently argued, I think she found the court of the Egyptian court um, quite claustrophobic and wanted more freedom. So apparently they would have these huge arguments. Um, but one of King Fuad's responses was to buy his wife, Queen Nasli, these wonderful pieces of jewellery. So apparently her ladies-in-waiting would check each morning, and if she had a new bracelet or a new piece, a new pair of earrings, it meant that they'd had a rather ferocious argument maybe the night before. Um, again, unfortunately, not the happiest ending to her life. So she ended up moving to California in 1946 with her youngest daughter, Princess Fabia, who'd married a Coptic Christian. And by this time, King Fuad had died and their son, King Farouk, was now, was now the King of Egypt and he was furious with this. So he stripped them of their titles and they ended up in a bit of financial difficulty. So Sotheby's actually ended up selling this Van Cleef necklace and tiara for the first time in 1975, where the necklace made $140,000 and the tiara made $127,500. And um, she, uh, Princess Nazi, passed away in 1978, and the necklace was again offered for auction by Sotheby's in New York in 2015, where it made a little bit more than the last time by selling for just over $4.2 million. Um, and this was actually bought by Van Cleef. Um, it was bought for their heritage collection of magnificent pieces that they've made in the past, and they still exhibit it today. So um, luckily enough, we can see it. So I most recently saw it at the Dubai Opera House a couple of years ago as part of their Treasures and Legends exhibition. And then staying on the theme of fabulous jewelry commissions, this next necklace in the slide, in the following slide is by Cartier, the Ivrez necklace. Um, and this was amazing. So custom made for the owner as designed as a cascade of diamonds. And we see all kinds of cuts here that we've been talking about in the previous slide. So brilliance, pears and marquee shaped. And then the, in these wonderful kind of floral motifs as well. And, the, uh, and then it suspends at the front nine principal pear-shaped diamonds, the largest of which weighed over 20 carats, um, the smallest of which weighed just over two. And it was accompanied by 30 GIA reports um, for diamonds ranging in size from 66 points up to this 20 carat diamond. Um, and they were all D color internally flawless, except for one E. Um, and signed Cartier came in a fitted case and ended up selling for just over 6.7 million Swiss francs. An absolutely stunning piece. Um, but let's go to today in the following slide. So as we mentioned to Fabio at the beginning, so Sotheby's has a few interesting auctions at the moment. So we're just gonna zone in and look at a few of the, uh, few of the diamond pieces that are coming up firstly in our London fine jewel sale. Um, which is taking place um, it's taking place at the moment and runs until uh, next Thursday, I believe the 24th of June. So firstly, looking at lot 10, and this has the old mine diamond. So looking closely at it, you can see what we spoke about before in terms of its irregular outline, its smaller table. And if you look through the table, you can see this large culet, the bottom facet, 
um, you can see it there. And it's a lovely piece of jewelry. This it's actually three pieces. You get three pieces of jewelry for the price of one, if you like. Um, so the middle ring set with the old one diamond weighing just under five carats, a nice color, SI1 clarity. So still nice and clean overall. And then actually comes with two diamonds that kind of slot over the top. These, uh, these turnsy bands that um, fit in around this, uh, this diamond ring. And um, then lot 75 is a ruby and diamond bracelet from about 1910. And the reason I wanted to look at this is it came from the time, you know, this is shortly after the South African diamond rush. Diamonds were now in plentiful supply. It meant that the jewelry houses and jewelry designers could work with a lot more material. And so we see this abundance of these lovely white jewels, if you like, particularly with the increased use of platinum with the diamonds. But this is a beautiful piece because we've got this lovely burst of color in the rubies as well. So the total diamond weight in this bracelet is about between 12 and 15 carats. And then we've also got over 10 and a half carats of Burmese and Thai rubies, all unheated. So they haven't been treated in any way to improve their color or their clarity. Um, and just a really attractive piece of uh, period jewelry there. Um, and then on the next slide, um, this is a very clever piece of jewellery, so lot 147. So this is what we call the illusion setting, where it's kind of like a bit of a jigsaw puzzle of these different cuts slotted together. So from a distance, this actually looks like one larger stone, when in fact it's comprised of these corner round brilliant cut diamonds and these baguette cut diamonds in the centre. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an estimated total of 1.3 carats in total and a very attractive price um, with a low estimate of only 2.8, uh, sorry, 2,800 pounds um, because of these smaller stones and not being just a singular large one. Um, and then lot 156, I'm just putting this in there because it's my favorite diamond cut, the Briolette cut, which is like a diamond bead. I just think they're so attractive, particularly when they draw a little bit of yellow color or a bit of color like these do here. They're an M plus color grade, so drawing noticeable yellow. But I think this goes really well with the yellow chain that they're suspended from. Um, and this comes, we're lucky enough to be able to publish that it comes from an important European private collection, so some nice provenance there as well, um, and a really attractive piece of jewellery with this beautiful diamond cut. Um, and then the next slide is quite an exciting auction that we're holding at Sotheby's New York. So this goes on until Thursday, which is the 17th. So it's running online now, um, and it's the highest valued piece of jewelry we've ever offered online in a sale. It's only one lot, one item that's being sold in this auction. And it's a 5003 round brilliant cut diamond that is G color, so nice and white with VVS2 clarity. Um, so nice and clean and triple X in terms of excellent cut, polish and symmetry. Um, and it has an estimate, as all our items do, so a low estimate of two and a half million, a high estimate of five million dollars. But what's interesting is this no reserve. Um, so a reserve in the auction world is the confidential amount agreed between the seller and Sotheby's about the minimum value that an item can sell for. And it's never above the low estimate. It's always the low estimate or below. Um, and sometimes we agree with the seller that there is no reserve. It just means that we will sell the item for no matter the highest bid on the day. Um, and we see this a lot with kind of lower value pieces of jewelry. So say if there's a, a bracelet that's estimated at 5,000 to 7,000 and the bids only reach three and a half thousand, then we can sell it. It's slightly lower than the low estimate, but that's the way it is. Very rarely do we see it on high value items such as this. So even though the low estimate is two and a half million, we think this is a fair, a fair market price. Um, it will sell for whatever the highest bid for is on the day. And when I last checked this morning, the bids were at 1.9 million. So it will be very interesting to see what it ends up selling for tomorrow. And it will give a good indication of the state of the white diamond market at the moment. And it's a beautiful stone, really attractive. It would look fabulous in any piece of jewelry, but it's also interesting to consider it maybe as an investment piece. 
um, which is an interesting concept when we think about the world supply of diamonds, because if we're thinking about what Ava was saying earlier on, so diamonds are formed, you know, deep, deep, deep into the earth, you know, somewhere between 100 and 800 kilometers down onto these high pressures, high temperatures, and they're brought up to the earth's surfaces by these volcanic eruptions. So to more manageable depths of between 150 um, and 750, uh, sorry, a few hundred meters below the Earth's surface, which is where we can get them. But we know that these diamond mines are starting to close. So the Argyle mine in Australia, for example, closed at the end of last year. And some experts are now thinking that we're looking at a maximum of 60 years before the last diamond mine closes. So increasingly, we're going to be looking at the secondary market, including auctions, for a supply of diamonds in the future. So worth bearing in mind when we're looking at these stones being sold through the auctions at the moment. Thank you, Sophie. So let's take a look now uh, about at how all these things that we talked about until now actually happen. So how do we, uh, which steps do we follow from the unearthing thereof and cleaning it to the fashion, the finished gemstone. So the main steps of the diamond cutting process, basically. So the basic steps are more or less the same as they used to be hundreds of years ago. The four major steps, the four main steps of the diamond cutting are, as you can see on your screen, the planning, cleaving or sewing, brooding and polishing. What has changed is not the order or the actual steps, but the addition of uh, modern technology in some of those steps. So let's take the things from the beginning. First of all, we'll always start with a, a professional called the planner, which he will, uh, he or she will perform the uh, so-called process of planning. So the planning is basically the decision on uh, whether the rough stone will be uh, suitable for cleaving, so splitting into or sewing, so mechanically cut through. So once this decision um, is made, then the actual cutting process begins. So the planner will draw, let's say, on the uh, surface of the diamond, several lines. These are the lines that you see here, this black ink line here and another one down there, which is what we call the marking. And these are the lines that uh, indicate the direction along which the next cutter should um, cleave or sew through the stone. So the planner will take one of the most important important decisions. So how to divide the large crystal into smaller ones, either divided in two or divided in more than two pieces. So either by uh, cleaving or by sewing. So the cleaving is a very traditional way of uh, dividing the uh, rough crystal, is basically dividing the rough by striking a, a very hard blow along specific crystallographic directions uh, of the diamond that allow the gem to uh, smoothly split into two pieces rather than um, smashing it into uh, many small um, diamonds. So, the uh, cleaver, the person that performs this uh, splitting, this process, is actually another very experienced and another very important uh, diamond cutter. This is a very important step as well. Imagine uh, if you will be working with a uh, high quality, large, very uh, rare uh, diamond and you have to simply uh, give it a blow with a hammer and hope to divide it into two. So it's quite a responsibility, let's say. So master cutters would actually do this uh, job. So instead of cleaving, the uh, planner might also decide to sew the piece instead of cleave it. So sewing is basically dividing the diamond in sections rather than uh, splitting it with a hard blow with a hammer, as we mentioned before. And we can either do this by a uh, mechanical way, so mechanical sewing, or with lasers, which is the more modern way of uh, sewing or cutting our way through the diamond. So the mechanical sewing involves um, a high-speed revolving blade, 
usually it's a, a very, very thin copper blade uh, that is covered with uh, diamond dust, oil and diamond dust, and simply it makes, slowly, makes its way through uh, the diamond. So it's like a, a knife, if you, if you wish, that cuts through uh, the diamond. The laser sewing is a more modern technique to divide the diamonds into two. Basically, instead of the blade, we replace this blade with a laser beam and it burns its way through the diamond and vaporizes it. So this is a, a process that, as we mentioned before, does not really have to respect any crystallographic um, directions of the diamond. It can burn, the laser can burn its way through any direction in the diamond. And it's also a um, process that is much faster than the mechanical sewing. If uh, we want to laser sew through, imagine, let's say we have an one color trough, it will take us about 20 minutes to uh, sew it with a laser. It will take about 120 minutes to mechanically sew through it. And the other um, advantage of the laser sewing is that it has offers greater versatility, as we mentioned, but also it usually offers greater yield. So it allows us to retain more weight from the rough. So after we have cleaved or sewn the uh, diamond, we pass through the bruting process, which is the process when uh, during which we form the basic face-up outline um, of the diamond. We prepare it for further fashioning. So the bruting um, works basically by grinding two diamonds against each other. So through the abrasion, as Sophie said, only diamonds can cut diamonds, only diamonds can uh, polish diamonds or scratch diamonds. So we need the diamond dust or another diamond to um, create this um, face-up outline as well. Also for the bruting, we can use lasers, of course. And the laser bruting was the more modern method that we have introduced in 1992. Uh, and we mostly use it for creating the face-up outline of fancy cuts. So instead of rubbing the diamonds against each other, rubbing a diamond against a uh, grinding machine, if you want, we take our lasers and we create the, um, the rough face-up outline of the, of the diamond. Especially for fancy cuts, we would mostly use laser bruting. And once the diamonds have been bruted, so they have their basic face-up outline, they will go uh, further to polishing. Polishing would start with the process of blocking. Blocking is the process during which we place the first um, major, the first main facets on the diamond, the first 17 or 18 facets, both on the crown and the pavilion. And this is another very crucial stage of the cutting process because it establishes the uh, basic symmetry of the finished gem. After we have blocked the diamond, we will continue with the process called brillianteering, which is, um, let's say, the, more or less the final step. It is the placement and the polishing, well, polishing and cutting happens at the same time in diamonds, which is not similar to the other colored stones. So uh, brillianteering is the placement and the polishing of the star facets and the upper and lower girdle facets. So the final smaller facets of the uh, diamond. In the end, the diamond's girdle would be faceted or would be polished and the diamond would be uh, inspected one final time. Actually, the cutters would stop and inspect the diamond after they have polished every facet to adjust in case they need to, to adjust the symmetry of the stone. We will clean the diamond in acid and the diamond would be ready to be graded and to be um, sold in auction or in retail. Um, we saw the diamond reports before we talked about briefly, we talked about the um, grading of fancy shaped diamonds. Well, the diamond reports, as you all know, are um, come in several types, let's say. Uh, the one we talked about before is the grading report, which will tell you about the quality of the diamond, but there are also those reports that tell, uh, give information or tell you about the nature of the material. 
As you know, it is of major importance today for the jewelry industry to distinguish between natural and laboratory grown diamonds or between untreated and treated diamonds. So these are uh, extra, let's say, uh, analysis that we perform in the laboratory with advanced technology here too, to give us information about the um, origin of the diamond, whether it's natural or not, and about the uh, possible presence of any treatments that might change the appearance of diamonds. For example, we saw a type 2A diamond before that Sophie mentioned, the one that um, typically came from the uh, color mine in Golconda. Well, imagine that there is a process today that we can perform on type 2A diamonds and from a brown color, we can make them turn into completely colorless stone. And those stones might also not show any um, evident characteristic in a standard uh, microscopic analysis. So we would need this extra analysis to identify the presence of the treatment, which will, of course, uh, dramatically change the value of the diamond itself. And to finish this, um, let's say, fascinating trip around the world of diamonds, I would like to introduce this well, unique diamond, it's still unique actually, it's the largest diamond we ever discovered, it's the famous Cullinan diamond, the amazing 3106.75 carat diamonds, you can actually see the size of the stone in his hand here, this is the mines uh, superintendent Mr. Wells. Um, when they discovered this diamond in uh, January 26, it was in 1905. In the beginning, when the diamond was discovered, it has a very peculiar story, actually. When it was discovered, it was so large, so unique, that most people, even in the office of the mine, did not really believe that this was a diamond. They thought it was a simple, any crystal, and they just left it hanging around for some time because it couldn't be a diamond. It was so large. Eventually, we found out that it's truly a diamond. It was named uh, the Kalidan diamond after the mine's um, director or owner at the time not after the person that actually uh, dug it up from the earth. And it was put on sale in April 1905 in London. It remained unsold for a couple of years. And then the um, Transvaal colony uh, government decided to buy it and present it to the king as a token of loyalty, as a gift for his upcoming birthday. So um, it was presented to King Edward who had it cut by uh, Mr. Joseph Asher. So back to that name that we mentioned before. So in this historic uh, instant and a historic picture you see down here, you see uh, Mr. Joseph um, Asher preparing to blow, to heat the diamond and cleave it into pieces. So this is how the cleaving process looks like. There is a man that holds a metallic blade, a steel blade, on a notch that has already um, scratched on the surface of the diamond, which we call a curve. And with the hammer, he will simply hit this metallic blade and um, the diamond is supposed to split into two. So they have been studying the diamond, studying the different crystallographic um, directions of the crystal. They found the uh, cleavage direction, the optimal of those cleavage directions and decided to cleave it this way. Of course, Mr. Asher was successful in uh, cleaving the diamond. So eventually the Kalinan crystal um, gave us more than 105, 105, I think it was in total, uh, different diamonds. So imagine this, 105 different finished diamonds from one rough only. Um, most of those, the, the biggest of those are part of uh, the uh, crown jewels of Great Britain. Some of them are in the uh, property, private property of the Queen. Um, she also owns a little bit of uh, some fragments of the Cullinan diamonds and others have been uh, polished and sold around the world. So uh, it is an exceptional example of what Earth can give us. There has not been another discovery since that. Uh, this big, we're still hoping, of course. Let's hope that in the next 60 years, as Sophie was saying, we will have another. That would be nice. 
I always love the story that Mr. Asher apparently fainted when he was cleaving this. Religion. Well, yeah, it was actually Quite a lot of pressure, you know. Yeah, they, they some some people say that he actually fainted after the blow. <laughs> then the Asher uh, family actually said that no Asher would faint in the process of cutting a diamond. So, so you know, there are sure. many, there are many stories around this. It, it was a, a historic moment, actually. It's, it's also very interesting to mention that. Um, this uh, traveling from London uh, mm. of this diamond to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, when it was actually polished, happened by train and ferry in the pocket of Mr. Asher. So, you know, there was okay. this person in the train carrying the 3,000 uh, carat uh, <laughs> diamond in his pocket. So, it's quite an exceptional um, <laughs> story. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. Really, thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. I, I think it's very, it was very great presentation and webinar. Let's uh, let's answer a few questions. Oh, well, not so few, by the way, but let's try to answer <laughs> some questions. Uh, let me try to organize them in topics, more or less. I think I'm able to do it. So let's start from uh, a very technical one. This is from uh, May Lien, and I think she is asking, so oh, forgive me if you're not a she, but I'm pretty sure. She's asking, what is the ratio of uh, heart shape? So I think he, she, mean, uh, she means the ratio between length and width in a heart shape. Length and width between a heart shape. Okay, yeah. there are some uh, ratios that are preferred by the market. Usually, the heart shapes should not be uh, too long or too wide. So one and a half to one or uh, two to one is one. usually preferred in the in the market. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, yes. Yes. And then uh, my size as is commenting, Ivresse from Cartier is amazing. I think she is right. Okay. <laughs> it was, I agree. <laughs> me too, me too, my okay. And then <clears throat> let's open a big topic in the questions because it's about Marquis shape. Mm. So we have Maria and Coco asking a few things about uh, Marquis shape. So let's start from Coco just in order of time. Uh, Koko is asking, do you have a breakdown of which percentage of stones are into which shape? So I mean in the different shape. And mm -hmm. uh, Marquis is still in fashion because it's the least favorite and uh, of Coco, and of course it just shot old woman. <laughs> <laughs> but let me add also one more question about. This question is from Maria, as I said before, and she's asking, is true the legend or story about King Louis XV that he asked for a shape, Marquis shape, considering the lips of uh, Madame Pompadour? So uh, let's see that. Uh, if you have some percentage, Eva, please let, uh, let us know. Well, uh, and, uh, uh, I will give you the, the floor you for the, the lips. <laughs> Louis XV. Uh, okay, so okay, Eva, you first. Um, yes, so uh, considering your, uh, well, it is a very personal thing, the taste for diamonds. Yes, it's true that uh, we tend, especially in the past years, to um, combine the marquee shape to older ages, but actually this is not true anymore. I mean, uh, there are some diamond cutting styles like the round brilliant or the uh, princess cut that are always in style. And there are some others like, you know, that, like the marquees that you mentioned that tend to uh, fluctuate in popularity if you want. Mm -hmm. So some years it's more popular, other years they're not so popular. Um, there is not a standard percentage that I can give you because um, the world's market is very variable. It depends on the different locations. There are some locations uh, that do not really prefer the fancy shapes at all. They like mostly the round brilliance. There are other locations that tend to um, admire the very high clarity of diamonds, so they would opt for um, emerald cuts mostly. So there is not a standard percentage. What I can tell you is that uh, in all the parts of the world, all around the world, the round brilliant cut is always number one in popularity. It's always the first option for diamonds, especially in sizes that range 
from let's say half a carat to about four or five carats. More than that, uh, many um, buyers would opt for an oblong shape like the oval shape or like the uh, pear shape because those diamonds don't really need the uh, depth, the height, if you wish, of the round brilliance to look nice. So they would uh, look very smooth, very elegant on a bigger size, on the finger or on any type of jewelry. Considering the marquees, from what I know, Sophia can nod on that, uh, mm -hmm. there has been a uh, return to it. I mean, I know that there have been some important uh, rings, especially of celebrities that have been um, sold in marquee shape. So mm -hmm. I think that there is a comeback on this shape. It depends, if it's, we're talking about a ring, it depends on the shape of the finger as well. I mean, the marquee shape would uh, enhance a long and thin finger. So why not? Slimming. And also, it's, you know, marquees cuts can vary individually as well, depending on their proportions, because we'd always, you know, we love what we call a nice fat marquee, yeah. which is, you know, has a good body. We don't like the skinny one. Don't like the skinny marquees. I'm sure that um, Madame Pompidou's mouth was lovely and fat. And that's what it was. <laughs> Yeah, so, so Sophie, we can say yes, this, this story is true. Right? It, it's really happened. I think it's a great story, so let's say it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Maria is asking, so they were in love? Yes. <laughs> very, very <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a partic participation together. Okay, that's okay. Uh, let's move on. So one, one more question. How do you calculate the price of uh, the 50 carat diamond, Sophie. Very, very good question. Uh, yeah, no, it's a very good question. So when we um, when we price diamonds in general, we use a lot of the time in the uh, in the auction field and also within the trade, we use something called the Rappaport list, which is kind of the industry standard, and it provides a price per carat for diamonds by clarity and by color it's released weekly um, and we have to be quite careful with it it's not you know the the be all and end all it's kind of used as a benchmark and a lot of the wholesale diamond prices that are given are a discount from this price given on the list and um, so we do use that as a benchmark and a help but when we get into very very large diamonds such as a 50 carat round brilliant we look more at you know past historical examples so 50 carat or thereabout diamonds that have sold in the past and what we think you know based on today's market we're kind of looking at so it's kind of twofold in the way that we have priced such an item um, but it's the, the very interesting thing about this is because, you know, because of COVID and everything um, happening, the white diamond market has been quite volatile recently. So this is actually the second uh, very large diamond that we've offered recently at Sotheby's without a reserve, which is giving the market kind of an opportunity to recalibrate, to reset and kind of set the price of white diamonds today. So last year we sold, it was a 102 carat um, uh, oval diamond D flawless and we sold that without reserve as well in Hong Kong it made 15.7 million dollars um, and so it's more interesting to see some uh, see on Thursday what this what this diamond actually sells for in the end and then that will be used in turn to kind of dictate future diamond prices in the future. Thanks Sophie okay. Thank you. Eva do you want to add something because I saw you no. No, you no fine. Fine. thank you. Okay. Then also we have uh, Saud asking, how much does it cost uh, to do a diamond report? Okay, so I will answer if you don't mind, because I prepared the answer for the past week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm giving you just the range now. Okay, so just to give you an idea, if you talk about uh, 10 points diamond, you are about, you are between 10 and 20 USD. You are talking about 50 points, so half carat diamond, you are about 30, 35, some institutes maybe 40 USD. When you are about one, again, it depends on the institutes, but you are between 50 and 100. So the range is a little bit, it's a little bit bigger. If you go on 50 carats, like the diamond before, the price is up on re upon request. So as you see, there is a there is more or less, considering the normal commercial diamonds, the prices are, are not so big. Mm. Mm. So there is no excuses for the retailer to do not ask for a report or to not commit a, submit, submit a stone for a report. And again, I have here, I keep 
I'm, uh, Coco is thanking you. So uh, thanks to you, Coco, for being with us. And then I kept for uh, last something very complicated to answer. Hmm? Something that required a bit of diplomacy. Just to break the ice, the first question is for Sophie, have you never hammered in action a synthetic diamond? Have I, sorry, repeat, have I ever what a synthetic? If you, if you have never hammered in action a synthetic diamond. So if I've been examining one, a synthetic no, diamond. So, sorry, so offer, for, for, offer for sale. No, we, we don't handle synthetic diamonds at all. Okay. Um, the only thing to be aware of, this isn't for auction, but it's been quite interesting recently where we're, we keep hearing about the entry of synthetic diamonds into the diamond market that we don't know about, which is happening a lot with melee, the very, very small stones. Yeah. Um, so it's something that we should very much be aware of because we might, I'm not talking about Sotheby's, but the, the whole world who are interested in diamonds might be handling synthetic diamonds that we don't know about. So it's always very important that we keep disclosing this information and keep natural and synthetics very much separate to one another. Um, but no, as far as I know, Sotheby's have not handled a synthetic diamond. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, talking about synthetics uh, again, the question is, uh, one is about the price of synthetics, so I'll try to give an answer, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's say that the price of a synthetic, uh, no matter the quality, uh, the four Cs, is always moving between one-fourth to one-fifth of the same quality of a natural, okay? Mm -hmm. This is talking about wholesaler level price. Then when the stone go to the retailer, is another story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And could I just, to add to that, which I thought was quite interesting recently, is seeing how De Beers are adding a synthetic diamond line to their collections. And they're actually using it as the more excessively priced, um, or kind of the entry point. For, uh, for buying De Beers collections. But I found yeah. that very interesting that they were starting to sell synthetics. Yeah. They have tried yeah. that in the past. And then, now it's a comeback. Because many people are talking about synthetics now. Yeah. 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 Eva, one more question about synthetics for you. If uh, men can do any kind of color, uh, shape, size uh, in uh, synthesis? For synthetic diamonds? This is for you. Well, yeah, the answer would generally be a yes. So uh, in the beginning, when we started developing the synthetics, we were limited with the colors and we were limited with the uh, sizes of the stones. Now this is not a limit anymore. So we can cre create, we can produce, let's say, even large diamonds. And by uh, adding different chemical elements, we can actually control the color that we get as well. So yes. Then I think this is the last one. This is a very nice question. This is by Eliza. She's asking, what is your favorite diamond shape and cut? Eliza, I answer for first. My favorite is heart shape. <laughs> now I leave it to you, Eva, Sophie, or Sophie, Eva, whatever. It's fair to say. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't, don't limit my, my imagination, you know. <laughs> I like several <laughs> different. Um, um, Cutting styles depending on the actual characteristics of the diamonds and on their uh, sizes. So I like diamonds in general, let's say. No. <laughs> um, for me, I love a beautiful, chunky old mine, an antique stone. I love oh, that. Right. Oh, I think they've got so much character. They're beautiful. They can have all it the is. inclusions. They can be lovely and yellow, but I love the character and I, I love agree. the shape. I think they're beautiful. Yeah. I agree. Um, and what about Marquise? Do you like Marquise? <laughs> <laughs> if it's a nice fat one, then I like a Marquise, but it has to be fat. The fatter, the better. <laughs> and you, Eva, Marquise? Yeah, why not? I mean, it has been given a bad name for uh, for many years. They have called it even the divorce stone. But you know, uh, I don't believe in that. No, some every diamonds every diamond is beautiful in its own uh, you know way. So as Sophie was saying, me too. I don't really prefer the very skinny ones, but I think that it is a very interesting shape. It looks like a bow. So it's some consider sailing. So yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, I'm um, just uh, let me do it in the last, the very fast check about questions. Okay, now we're QA, no more question. 
in our uh, other channel, no more question. Okay. Okay. So I think we can close our webinar here. Uh, let me thank all the people, all the attendees that spent this more than one hour with us. So we are always late. So I'm sorry for that, but happy <laughs> to see all of you with us until the end. And let me thank also uh, Sophie for being with us and Eva for being with us. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you again. Bye bye. Bye bye, all. <laughs>